Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for those very kind words. It is uh, a wonderful privilege to be here. I've known uh, about CCDA since its founding and uh, never had the opportunity to uh, be part of uh, a wonderful gathering of uh, people who do the same things that uh, I love doing, working with poor people, learning from them, uh, demonstrating the power of the gospel in the lives of poor people and seeing the gospel become very real in the lives of people. I'm so grateful. I met John Perkins about 24 years ago in this city actually in Pasadena and uh, John and Vera May in their home and instantly discovered and before that of course John and I were on a uh, advisory team of a group of uh, people called Partnership and Mission who uh, in the early 70s were concentrating on discovering the wholeness of the gospel. We talked about the wholeness of the gospel. And uh, it was a great journey for many of us when, because when you talked about the poor and the wholeness of the gospel, you were seen as actually left-wing radical communists. And that was a difficult thing to do in those days, to write. And uh, I still remember an international conference where one of my friends talked about working with poor people, how important it is to work with poor people. And uh, a German church leader turned around at the end of it and said, you talk like that, we have paid for you to come to this conference all the way from Africa. And you dare to talk and criticize us and tell us that we are not committed to the poor and take us away from the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a terrible feeling. Some of us got together, and we didn't have a lot of money in those days. We just put together a bit of money, enough to be able to say, here is the money you paid for the ticket. Please take it. Amen. But God has blessed that movement since then because of people like John Perkins and uh, Wayne Gordon and a very variety of others who incarnated themselves, went and worked with poor people, began to learn from them, and began to cross all kinds of barriers, theological, social, economic, and began to discover the real power of the gospel. The real power of the gospel. It's whole power to change not just some internal feelings, but individuals, transform them, transform communities, transform nations. That is the power of the gospel. In that shadow of that wonderful gospel, we celebrate our oneness. Isn't that true? That's something so marvelous and wonderful. I really want to thank God for all of you, your testimonies and your vision. Today has been a very rich, rich feast. And this evening especially has been such a rich feast. And so what I'll say will probably only be a footnote. But that's what it is. And what I'll share with you. Mission as crossing cultures and boundaries. Whenever we talk about, when well, I certainly think of cross-cultural barriers, I know of one story that sort of illustrates it very, very well. I'm sure you'd have heard of it, and so it'll be an old hat to you, but maybe my interpretation might be slightly different. It's a story about the Pope and some Baptists. Did you hear that? Now, this is a story about the Pope. Now, some Baptist ended up by having a choice piece of land in the Vatican, near the Vatican, in Rome. And with globalization and everything else, it was becoming so much more, you know, attractive and expensive land. And the cardinals were getting very worried and said, you don't really want these Baptists around the place. Said to the Pope, why don't you get rid of them? He said, well, these days, it's days of freedom and democracy. Even a Pope can't do a great deal, so I've got to be very careful. I can't kick them out. And so the Pope, uh, said, well, let me see what we can do. So he invited the deacons to come, and the Baptist deacon said, well, it's the end. They want to get rid of us. They want this land. We need to be, we've been there for 200 years, but they want to get rid of us. Okay. They went there, and the Pope said, I'm a fair man. I'll give you a deal. We'll have a contest about who has the best ritual. And if you win, you can have the land. Now, that is a difficult thing. The 
poor Baptist deacons don't know the meaning of the word ritual, let alone what ritual is all about. And so they said, we gave up. And so they said, hey, we won't go for the contest. One of the farmers, a Baptist farmer, said, well, let me go. He, he was in his overalls. And he went to this contest. It was in the Sistine Chapel, you know, in, uh, uh, in Rome, the Sistine Chapel, that glorious chapel. The, and the Pope came with all his wonderful robes. And the cardinals came with their hats and robes and everything else. A wonderful procession came right through. And there they said, and here was this overall wearing a Baptist uh, deacon, not deacon, he was a farmer who was standing there. Well, okay, let's begin. So the Pope said, Pope did like this. And uh, the Baptist farmer said like that heard that? And the Pope, of course, said like this. The Baptist farmer said like that. The Pope took the Eucharist, the bread, and lifted it up and said, and showed it like that. The Baptist farmer took an apple from his pocket and started eating. <laughs> and the Pope said, well, you won. Finished. It's over. And he went off. The cardinals were shocked. How could he win? How could he, how could he lose like that? So they asked the Pope, what happened? He said, well, I said, God is everywhere. And the farmer said, but God is here now. And uh, I said, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, but God is one. I said, here is the basis of our salvation, the body of Christ. He said, but it all began with an apple. <laughs> well, the deacons went up and the, he went back and told the deacons, we've won. What did you do? What did you say? Well, the Pope said, you go anyway, get out of here, go. I said, we are staying right here. <laughs> the Pope said, I'll give you three days. We said, not one of us will leave. The Pope took out his lunch, and I took my lunch out. <laughs> now, imagine what a cultural barrier that is. Okay. Now, mission has a cultural barrier. What I want to do is to, for us to grapple with culture itself. To look at culture and grapple with it itself and look at the Bible and see how, does, how did the apostles do it? Did they not have to cross cultural barriers? Who do we turn to? We will turn to the apostles, Peter and Paul, and discover how they dealt with the calling to cross cultural barriers. In Acts chapter 10, you remember that story, verses 9 to 16, when Peter is given that vision of all those animals coming down Four-footed animals, reptiles and birds. Reptiles and birds. And he's told, kill and eat. Now that was a culture shock for that poor fellow, Peter. This is God administering a culture shock. It's not the culture, but God must have had a smile on his face as he did this to him. All these funny things. I mean, I still remember the shock on my wife's face when we were in a Wonderful banquet in Hong Kong. Bob Lupton was there actually, and his wife, I think. Wonderful banquet in Hong Kong. 12 course meal, wonderful Chinese meal, a most expensive thing, and the first course was snake soup. She, she didn't know what to do. She said, what do I do, snake? How can I, I can't eat snake. Can you? And this is supposed to be, it's October, you see, the beginning of winter, and the most important thing you should have is snake soup. And therefore, she said, you've got to do this for me. So, under the table. <laughs> have you done that? <laughs> under the table, I had to have, and she would give the impression she was actually having the snake soup. And I had to keep on having more and more of it. <laughs> Can you believe that? Okay. Well, that is what, that, the culture shock, the whole issue of a culture. And Peter was given this culture shock, kill and eat. And he couldn't do anything. And God says, but what God, I have cleansed. 
Why are you making? Why are you calling something impure and unclean? Why are you making these cultural judgments? Don't be hasty. Don't apply your given knowledge to something so different. I am telling you, but culture, you, when culture shocks takes place, you don't even listen to God. Can you believe that? But God was saying, you obey me. I'm telling you. He said, no way. I can't imagine Peter. I mean, the same old Peter, of course. I can imagine Peter. Remember how he bluffed earlier on? Three times. This time also three times he rejects God. It's the same three. Three times he rejects God. And he says, no, 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 no. But then it happens. He goes to Cornelius. And then he preaches. And remember what happens in Cornelius' home? The Holy Spirit comes pouring down. The Holy Spirit comes pouring down. Yes, would you like to do that? The Holy Spirit comes pouring down on people. But the wonderful thing about that story about the Holy Spirit coming on the Gentiles, on, the, uh, uh, on all those people gathered in Cornelius' house, is something very interesting. See, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit comes. I mean, if I was a preacher, I would have said to God, God, why can't you wait till I finish? Huh? Let me finish, I haven't finished yet. And then it all comes right down. Wonderfully. Because God was telling Peter something. You're only an instrument. It's not you. You don't have to even complete your work. I'm there. All you had to do was just go and obey. Go. Go to them. You, didn't, you, you couldn't understand it. These are Gentiles. You don't know how to communicate to Gentiles. You've always seen them as dogs, as people far away. But just go. Just go. Obey me. With all your fears, all your doubts, all your uncertainties. I just don't know. I cannot understand. I will not go. But okay, let me go. Let me see for myself. And he preached his sermon. And God says, that's enough, that's enough, then that's enough. And then the whole situation changes. You see that, how wonderful it is? And thousands come to Christ. But then you see what happened. If you read again Acts chapter 11, something else happens in heaven. Barnabas was a different guy. He was an apostle too, in a way. Barnabas goes there and he looks at it in an entirely different way. Barnabas goes there and sees that same situation. The Gentiles having the Holy Spirit. But if you sent a Peter, Peter would have gone with a checklist and said, are these really Christians? He would have gone with a checklist and said, do you really believe in Christ? I mean, do you really know what it's all about? And he would have gone like an inspector, a government inspector, inspecting them to see if they were kosher, if they were right, if they were honest, if they were real. What does Barnabas do? There's a beautiful passage there. What evidence did he see there? He saw the evidence of the grace of God. Verse 23 of chapter 11. He saw God at work. His eyes, I mean, he also was a Jew. What made him see what Peter could not see? He saw God ahead of him. Peter was taking God to the Gentiles. Barnabas knew that God was already ahead of him working among the Gentiles. He was right there. And all he was saying was, God, you've taken me there. What have you done so far, God? That's a question to ask when you cross cultural barriers. God, you're taking me to another group of people, to another culture, a different people. You call me there. Now tell me, what have you been doing with them so far? That's your question to God. You see that? Rather than saying, I've got to be faithful. How can I take God? I've got this wonderful, precious message. I'll mess it up. And you're so terrified, like a newborn missionary, and you will mess it up. You see that? And what a wonderful spirit. You know, Barnabas is my favorite, favorite character in the New Testament. He did wonderful things. He was the one who identified Paul when everybody was terrified of Paul. Can we believe this guy? Do you think he's really converted? Or is he one of these fifth columnists? Is he faking it? It's a fake. Who trusted Paul? 
Barnabas said, I'll take care of the guy. If it's a fake, I'll die. Let me take him. And he looked after him. He took risks. Barnabas was willing to take the risk that God was working out there. He took risks with Paul. He took risks with young John Mark and took him when Paul quarreled with him. You remember the story? He took risks. Barnabas was a real risk taker and therefore he could easily see God at work. His eyes were open. And he could see God at work in other cultures, in other people, in people who are very different from him. And that was most wonderful indeed. So what did we do? What did, Paul, what did Barnabas do? And what was God saying? Recognize the difference. Identify God at work and rejoice. And then it says something wonderful with, he was glad. Verse 23. He saw God at work and he was glad. He didn't do anything. Often we are glad when we are successful. Are we glad when God is working elsewhere in spite of us, without us, with no connection to us? Can we rejoice and say, praise the Lord? We rejoice. What a wonderful person, Barnabas. He was glad. He rejoiced. Because God was already working there. And that is the wonder of cross-cultural Breaking cross-cultural barriers. You see God at work and in magical and wonderful ways. And you say, oh my goodness. How wonderful, how magical, how gracious, how glorious God is. And we rejoice. Then we have in chapter 15 of Acts, we have Paul and Barnabas called to the council in Jerusalem. People were hearing. They've crossed these cultural barriers. They've gone to people who are different. They got to these Gentiles. And we hear they have become Christians. And they, we hear their Holy Spirit is there. We are not sure. We are not sure. What, what kind of a confused religion is it? It's a distortion. Let us be clear. So they hear it. So what did they do? And that is another wonderful thing. Here are people who were Jews. Who had quarreled with the Gentiles all their life had caricatures of each other. For the first time, make such a wonderful decision of the Jerusalem Council. What do they do? They say, they affirm the dignity of Gentiles. Instead of calling them dogs, they said, you are just like us. It's all right to be a Gentile, to eat and dress the way you do. And you have a wonderful phrase there, which I've heard over and over again in cross-cultural circles. Them and us. Have you heard about them and us? Them and us. Read that in the Bible. It's right there. In the Jerusalem Council it says, made no distinction between them and us. <laughs> Did you ever think that the Bible was so relevant? Right there. And those people in Jerusalem, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, instead of saying, we are different. We are God's people after all. We are different. We are different. We are different. And they are so different. Instead of saying that, they saw by the Holy Spirit. God has made no distinction between them and us. We are one. They said, affirm their dignity. It's all right for Gentiles to be like themselves. To eat and dress the way they do. They accepted their identity. And that is the heart of Christian mission is to be able to say to people in your own culture, in your own situation, God will find you and transform you. And that is the wonder of Christian mission. No other religion has it. A wonderful friend of mine, Professor Lamin Sane, he's from Guinea, Bissau. He is a Muslim convert and he's the professor of world Christianity at Yale University. One of the most wonderful Christian thinkers and leaders uh, in the world today. In my estimation, the most wonderful scholar uh, global scholar. He should come and speak. He'll love you. He'll enjoy you. The man, very practical and wonderful man. Laman wrote a, many books which are globally translated. He talks about the most important thing about the gospel is its translatability. That means the gospel becomes translated into other languages. Quran can never be translated into any other language. There's only one culture which is imposed, which is the Arabic Quranic culture, which is imposed on everybody. Of course, it doesn't really work, so there are some concessions. But there's only one true culture. There's no one true Christian culture. 
The Jews did not impose the Jewish Christian culture on the Gentiles. And since then, it has been a cultural recovery of all the cultures. The Tamil language of South India is about 4,000 years old. It's a very ancient language. There are wonderful, wonderful writings going back to even 3,000 years old. Older than Sanskrit, which is the mother language of Indo-Sanskritic languages, including all the European languages. And yet, it was dead for over a thousand years. In the sense, it was dying. Nobody recovered it. Who spent time recovering that language? Christian missionaries. Recovered it. So who are the famous recoverers of this language? They went and said, the gospel must be heard in your language, in your culture. It must make sense among you as you see it. And therefore, they went and painstakingly worked at it. So that glorious things are recovered. So I can read in that same language from 2nd century BC, written by a woman poet. You know what she said? A poet who wanted to know God. And she wrote something like this. Oh, that I might have thousand tongues so that I can sing your praise. And I said, I thought Charles Wesley wrote it. <laughs> Do you remember? Now, so that God's voice could be heard in that language. That's what the Christian faith is. And that's what the Jerusalem Council released for us. That cultures are precious. People of different cultures are precious in their own way. And we need to affirm that and relate to that and work with them and enjoy that, celebrate it, and discover Christ in that wonderful sense. That's what it's all about. Of course, there were prescri- certain things were, they were challenged to be faithful to the gospel and they're asked not to turn to idols, give up certain things, sexual immorality and meat of strangled animals. I don't have much time to go with that. Then enter Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And he demonstrates to me the one who crossed frontiers, crossed barriers of culture. The apostle Paul, my friend. That's since my favorite apostle, really. Crossing cultures was not an adventure to him. It was a calling. It was a calling. And that is very clear. In Galatians chapter 2, we have that very clear description as Paul talks about how he was called to the Gentiles. And how Peter and his group of people were called to the Jews. You know, there is a very interesting phrase there. I think I should really actually turn to the Bible and read that for you. Because it is very, very telling indeed. It is, it says, James, Peter, and John, those reputed pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me, the calling given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. Verse 10 of chapter 10. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the gospel. Sure. What does it say? Remember the poor. The very thing I was eager to do. Did you ever think that Paul was on the side of the poor? If you hear some preachers preach about Paul, they've never talked about Paul and the poor, did you? Huh? Paul, the one thing that was common to both these cultural missions, one to the Jews, the other to the Gentiles, what was the common thing? Remember the poor. Don't forget the poor. It is as you address yourself to the poor in that context. That is the common thing. And that's where you'll be faithful to the gospel. The wholeness of the gospel. So cross-cultural mission, crossing cultural boundaries, which misses the poor, misses the wholeness of the gospel. You ought to know that? Please note that. Any kind of a cross culture or an initiative, an activity which misses the focus on the poor fails the priority of the gospel itself. And that is what Paul said. I'm eager to do. In fact, the Greek word says, it's a sort of a, it's a new word which says, I'm more than eager to do. I'm passionate about doing this. I want to do it. I don't need, no one need to tell me that I must remember the poor. That's the most important thing for me too. That's what he was saying. And he did it as well. 
And yet in the next chapter of Galatians, you have Peter, the failure of Peter. When he faces a cultural barrier, fear and hypocrisy. And Paul attacks him. I mean, I feel sorry sometimes. Paul was an aggressive guy. He must have been a short guy like me. Aggressive, you know. So he went for his throat for the juggler. Did you see that? He went for him and said, you, Peter, how dare you do this? How dare you be such a hypocrite in the midst of this? How dare you do, do this out of fear and hypocrisy? He says, you're afraid and you're a hypocritic also. And that's often the problem. When you want to really deal with cross-cultural barriers, the real danger is our own fear and our own hypocrisy. Because we are unwilling to show, because it reveals our weaknesses. It's not easy. We are afraid on the one side, we are fearful about what we'll face. On the other side, it takes the masks off us. And we are afraid. And that is the most dangerous thing. But if we have to do it, God will enable us to do it. Paul's integrity, he accepted cultural diversity. diversity. And Paul and culture, again in Acts, uh, book, Acts is a wonderful book on cross-cultural mission. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to Athens, you remember. Verses chapter, six, verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. He recognized as he preaches to these people, these were not the poor, these were the very sophisticated, the intellectual class of that time of the whole world. Brilliant people, philosophers, who debated, who, who wonderfully deal, dealt with ideas. He recognized people interpreted his message from their knowledge and ex experience. He affirmed their culture. He did not judge externally. He used their own words and judgments to open the gospel message. Not willing to compromise the message too. It's hard when you're trying to cross cultural barriers to be sensitive to people. I still remember the real tension my wife had. I mean, the, use, the reason I use my wife all the time is we agreed early on that she will practice and I will preach what she practices. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, all the difficulty of practice is hers, all the, the joy of preaching is mine. Okay? And uh, she... We were in this area, we had, uh, we had helped people to f get land and uh, housing and all that. People wanted, as they were rehabilitated, it's a big slum which was being thrown out and uh, this is about 17 years ago. And uh, here was a, uh, we were, they, they wanted land and as Hindus, some of them, they wanted a temple. And so they built a temple. The Muslims built their mosque and the Christians built their church. The Christians, of course, wanted a Protestant church and a, a Catholic church. The, Hindus all wanted only one temple, the Muslims all wanted one mosque. That's a bit sad, but that's how it was anyway. But uh, the point was, at that point, my wife was the one who helped them to do it. She was asked, would you op inaugurate the temple? Oh. For an evangelical, how do you inaugurate a Hindu temple? What would you do, tell me? <laughs> You'll fall sick or have something and run away? <laughs> it's a difficult question, you have to live with them. If you say no, you'll insult them. If you say yes, your evangelical people say, we always knew there was something wrong with your theology. <laughs> what do you do in a situation like that? So we prayed about it. I said, well, the only thing is to tell them why, what you want to do. So she did just like us. We, we, we read that passage. So she went there and said, look, I can do it only if you allow me to do it in the name of Jesus. So she said, if you allow me to pray and do it in the name of Jesus. You know what we do is we break a coconut. Have you seen coconuts? Huh? Just break a coconut. Uh, and that, th that's the way we inaugurate things in India. And uh, so what she did was, she said, she, made a, she prayed a long prayer. She said, Lord Jesus, here are people who long to know God. And that's why they want a temple. A temple is a sign of their desperate desire to know God. You're the God who longs to meet with people. This is a temple. And Lord Jesus Please, as people come to this temple and worship whatever idol there is, you be real to them and you meet them. So she said, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> Isn't that? But that is affirming. 
So since then, whenever we have an evangelistic meeting, we have about two a year, once at Easter and once at Christmas, what do we do? We invite the Hindu priests and the Muslim imams to be on the platform to inaugurate our evangelistic rallies for the week. So they can say to their people, it's a good message for you to hear and respond to. Because they know we've never attacked them and their culture. They're simply sharing what is the most precious thing for us, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, but then we need to be addressing culture as well. Because the devil is also at work in culture. We need to be transforming cultures. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans 12. Be transformed. Do not conform. Be continually transforming. Jesus' parables of leaven in the culture. We need to be countercultural. And therefore, there is a tremendous challenge to address cultures. Not to just accept them, address cultures. Jesus said, this is what you've heard, but I say unto you, your standards ought to be different. You've got to constantly keep lifting people in any culture to the highest that you know about God's standards. In fact, Paul goes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he makes a, he makes a, you know, it's a warlike statement. He says, we fight with weapons. We, our weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Our weapons are there. Our power is to demolish strongholds and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Huh, did you hear that? Every thought in any culture, we want to make it obedient to Christ. Take it captive. Oh yeah. While we respect, we go across cultural barriers, we know that the only thing that matters to us is that when every culture, every person is able to bow down and say, Jesus is Lord. That is, we will never stop. And that's why we are countercultural. Culture is a barrier. I would like to use the word, not a culture as a barrier, but as a boundary. It's often, it's a porous boundary, not rigid. It has different sides, religious, social, political, economic, and intellectual. I would like to suggest, from the Bible, several drives, approaches to this as we sort of try to wrap this up. Number one is the models of crossing cultural boundaries. The first is incarnation. Jesus crossed the boundary from heaven to from heaven you came precious babe into our world. Incarnation that is the example of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. He that made, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, even though he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, emptied himself. What does that mean? Emptying. Self-emptying. So incarnation requires to be able to go across, and that's why that wonderful story this evening of that of pastor, isn't it? He had to empty himself to be able to really cross those barriers. Self-emptying first. Servanthood, he became a servant, Jesus did. There to serve, not to glorify oneself. And thirdly, sacrifice. He gave up his life. So to cross cultural barriers requires incarnational living. Truly to incarnate ourselves into that. To cross over into that boundary requires that. Secondly, it requires reconciliation. I just want to say here a personal note about Spencer. Spencer used to quote me, I believe, quite a bit on reconciliation. And one of the things that he did at Harvard University years ago, when he was speaking at Harvard to a group of young people, he quoted me about uh, reconciliation. That's something that I wrote years ago. And there was a young man of Indian origin, uh, born in this country, of course, was a student there, and he was actually the, uh, the president of the Christian Union there. And uh, he heard about this. He said, I must try and meet this man. So he wrote to John Stott and eventually came to spend some time with me in India. 
and today he's my son-in-law. <laughs> and a wonderful Christian at that. Well, that's what I want to say. That is a very interesting thing indeed. So he searched all that. That's a link with Spencer. Reconciliation. Ephesians 2, it says. Ephesians 2, remember? Ephesians 2, it says, on the cross of Christ, the dividing wall of hostility was, what was that? What happened to it? Broken down by the blood of Christ. So the blood of Christ breaks down the dividing wall of hostility. So from hostility, and in that same passage, you have peace, shalom. From hostility to shalom. In cross-cultural relationships, it can either be hostility or it can be shalom. But the cross of Christ stands right there in the middle and the blood of Christ flows right through, breaking down all that hostility and creating true shalom wholeness, peace, right relationships, flourishing of everything so that nothing becomes less than what God intends it to be. That is God's promise. And that is what Christ accomplished on the cross. And that is what we need to do. That's why our call to reconciliation. Call to incarnation, call to reconciliation. Thirdly, a call to transformation. No status quo. Not just that we can't get along. You know, I, I like the word. We, why can't we all, all get along? Yes, fine. But we must all be changed and transformed. Then only we can get along. Just as we are, we cannot get along. It'll only be a surface getting along. Nice smiles, but then relaxing. I still remember missionaries, some missionaries used to come to my home. I had a, my parents had a fairly reasonably good home. And uh, they they had good things and therefore missionaries would come and just relax and say oh thank god we are in your home we can eat the right kind of food the bathrooms are clean the white like we're used to you have a fridge and uh, everything else i used to wonder my goodness me have you been trying to escape the poor people you've been working with for so long that you now feel relaxed only here you understand what i mean have you, have you seen that People are so wonderful to you, and when they go back to their own homes, they say, oh, I'm glad that's over now. That's not getting along. We need to be all changed. And we can only be changed. I tell you one thing, true transformation is not really possible unless you cross cultural barriers. Deep transformation. Deep transformation is never possible unless you're willing to cross barriers, cultural barriers. Then only deep transformation is possible. Because every mask will be stripped off. You have to face the real yourself as you cross cultural barriers. Then only you'll see yourself. And then transformation is the deepest and the greatest and long-lasting. Finally, call to stewardship. Stewards. I think, you know, I'm increasingly now beginning to see that our calling is not primarily to transformation, it's to stewardship. We are stewards of the gospel, which means we are stewards of our neighbors, that's what it is. Simply, we are stewards of our neighbors. Love your neighbors yourself means you're a steward of your neighbor. If you're a steward of your neighbor, you've got to give him the best. What is that? The gospel first, because that's central. Without the gospel, whatever feeding you do won't make really much difference. Housing, everything else. No, it is the gospel. But all those things as well, because he's your neighbor. You're stewards of God's creation. So recovery of stewardship, and that is empowerment. Let me close with another story. As we speak here, there's a boy who's about 12 years old. His name is Danny Stone, who's struggling to be alive. My wife, and, my wife not me, but my wife as usual, uh, found him in... Uh, dying, stabbed, the police brought him to us. He was being brought up in a cemetery. He was being brought up in a cemetery because his, pair, his, his mother had gone off to be a prostitute in Bombay. His father had gone somewhere and Danny's kidneys were gone. He was literally, nobody knew whether he'd live or die. Then we took him in he came and lived with us in our home. 
Danny's story was told in the newspaper about his real struggle to be alive. It broke all the barriers. We had Hindus, Muslims, everybody pouring in to support, to help support. Because we, he needs a dialysis every two days, and that's very expensive in India. We are waiting for a kidney. Of course, we can buy kidneys in India, but you can't, you know that. As Christians, you couldn't really buy a kidney. And the whole city was galvanized, the city of Bangalore, with the story of this one boy. And every time the reporters came to him, Danny became a poet. He'd write poetry, and he would sing. It's a bit of a, I mean, he had only one tune. He'd sing the same tune for every poem that he wrote. But it was, it was wonderful. Wonderful poetry. Praising Jesus and what Jesus has done. Wonderful. Today he's struggling because there are no more places where they can give dialysis. They're giving it through somewhere here. They're doing surgery. And they don't know whether he'll live because there are no kidneys. Will you pray for Danny? But you see, as we worked with the poor, it broke all cultural barriers. It lifted Jesus Christ up. And to me, the most powerful thing was there was a New Zealand couple who had been worked, who had been coming for the last 20 years to one of the Indian gurus, Sai Baba. I don't know whether you know the name. He's a very powerful man, does a lot of miracles. You know, he does any miracle that any Pentecostal preacher can ever do. I, mean, I tell you, he can do more things than any Pentecostal preacher I know. And he does that millions of people. Massive. And he's done it for the last 35 years. And, oh, thousands, tens of thousands of Westerners come to be his disciples. Okay. He doesn't leave the country. They come to him. And this couple began to see through this young man, Jesus Christ. And in the last year, they've come to Christ. See, it is as we cross these barriers, as we really lift up the poor, as we really work for transformation, that's really what our calling is. And in the ministry to the poor, in holistic ministries, we are continually challenged with barriers, cultural barriers. We are continually crossing them. May I encourage you? For incarnation, reconciliation, transformation, and stewardship. And may God bless you and lead you as you're faithful to the gospel. Amen.